So how did I get into STEM? Yeah, so I have been an artist for as long as I remember, and I always ever identified as a visual artist. Mm. And growing up, I had a real love of nature. So nature was a continuous source of fascination. And I have pretty early memories of wanting to build at the time, what seemed like magical things like a bat or uh, a squirrel that would fly along tracks on the roof of my bedroom. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, also, I also wanted to, so my, my mom was, all, well, my whole family was big into nature and my mom used to take me on these trips with the Museum of Natural History called Amphibian Alert. And we would go in the spring and the sound of the spring peepers chirping, you know, that sonic, immersive, visceral experience was, had a huge impact on me. And it was something that I just imagined, like how cool would it be if you could capture that, if you could recreate it. But I didn't grow up in a family of engineers. So I had no language for anything STEM related. I did have a Commodore 64 computer and my brother and I would play around with that, but I wasn't frankly that drawn to computers. Like they were just not visually or sculpturally appealing to me as objects. I just saw them as like a beige case. <laughs> I was just to say a beige box was not appealing to you with like brown keys. No, no we're not. Yeah. I think Commodore no, 64 had a like tiny rainbow on them, didn't they? <laughs> I mean, it was like a novelty that you could, you know, play, play with them a little bit, but the video games back then were not that interesting. There weren't yeah. great regular graphics. And, you know, we had an Atari game console, but it never occurred to me that I could hack into it. <laughs> Long story short, you know, I did have, I was privileged to have technology in my life, but, it, you know, computers to me were synonymous with like things that boys played with and or no. the computer that I had to write my high school papers on. So that was, that was pretty <laughs> much it for me. I, I was not a STEM kid with the exception that given my love of nature, I, I, I did get interested in biological science. Mm -hmm. and, and this was something, you know, running in tandem with art. I was also, by the way, I mean, adults in my life were like, you know, art's not, you don't, you don't make money as an artist, right? You know that. So <laughs> here, you need some way to make money. I railed against that and I still do. <laughs> but, but in college and then after college, like I bounced around a lot because I hadn't, I couldn't find my voice. I wasn't a traditional artist. I mean, yes, I grew, I painted, I sculpted, but there, I wanted something more. There was this part of me that was always drawn back to science. So I actually went to veterinary school for a while and then dropped out of that to go to my master of fine arts and dropped out of that. But prior to dropping out, I had a fateful meeting with my neighbor in my studio complex, who was an MIT graduate, a man named Kevin Brown, who is the founder and owner of Brown Innovations. They're an audio engineering company in Boston or were at the time, I assume they're still there. Mm -hmm. And Kevin saw that I was using a lot of scientific metaphor in my in my art. And he said, you know, you should go to MIT. I was like, you are insane. You know, I, mean, <laughs> I had no, you know, I had taken like up to calculus in mathematics and I did have a lot of biological science in my background because I took it all to get into veterinary school. So that was okay. But, you know, engineering and, and math and all the things you think of when you think of MIT, it's like, yeah, I had none of those qualifications. But anything, one, one thing led to another. And it also happened to be, it was the end of the nineties, the dot-com boom was happening. There was a lot of money going into creative, innovative, out of the box, radical thinking. And I met Michael Hawley who's unfortunately now deceased, but Michael Hawley was just an incredible creative, like there are no limits, like there isn't a problem I can't solve. You know, he was just, 
he was really a, a wonderful thinker. And he invited me to join his research group at the MIT Media Laboratory. And three months later, I matriculated without ever having applied to MIT. I did <laughs> later. I think I remember filling out the actual application forms, but I mean... How crazy is that, right? So <laughs> I started education, started at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, stranger than fiction, but that's what happened. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love I love the atypical way of matriculating too. <laughs> I mean, there were so many things that had to go right. It was a miracle, you know, really. <laughs> it was a miracle of being in the right place at the right time, meeting the right people. And, and also having, I mean, it wasn't like I, there was obviously something about me and my hybrid creativity that they were attracted to. And I, I had, you know, I mean, I was definitely using a lot of chemistry and biochemistry metaphors in my artwork. So I had that kind of thinking again with the, the dot com thing exploding and so much optimism happening in the late nineties, I think, Michael Hawley and the and and the Media Lab felt like, well, you know, why not give it a try? Let's let's take an artist who has obviously a penchant for science and scientific thinking and put her in the Media Lab environment with computer scientists and electrical engineers and see what happens. And that's exactly what they did. Now, what they didn't tell me was that I actually did have to take classes. <laughs> like I had to you know, I took John Maida's Design by Numbers courses, and I'll, I will never forget. This is no joke, okay? My first computer science class ever with John Maida, you know, like, this is like, it's mm -hmm. like going to the moon, right, for STEM. <laughs> my first ever computer science assignment was John Maida saying that I needed to write a Java app that would load in a photograph and a simple tool where I could draw on the photograph and then convert the photograph using a fast Fourier transform <laughs> to whatever weird image that became, be able to draw on it again and then do a reverse fast Fourier transform. So I was like, oh my God, I mean, how many people want this are, are wrong? Like, what is an app? What is Java? I mean, how do I, so, so what happened was I, and this is actually, I mean, this defined my entire career at the MIT Media Lab. I had no choice but to tell my story of like, okay, I'm the token artist that Michael Holly invited to join his research group and I'm screwed because I don't know anything. So please like work with me. I'll buy you a pizza. <laughs> I'll, I'll make you a drawing, like I'll help you design your product casing or whatever. Please ah. do my homework. And so I had just wonderful colleagues when I was there who would give me snippets of code. I mean, they wouldn't do my homework for me, but they would give me oh. snippets of code, you know, for example, like the shell of an applet. So I was then able to like go in and make some adjustments. There's a lot of collaborative and it, and it was supported. I mean, I don't think that we were plagiarizing or anything like that. It was, it was understood that yeah. it was, a, you know, it was hard and that we had to help each other. But so, yeah, I mean, I learned how to write code basically by, you know, all the kindness of my, my colleagues, my, my friends at the media lab. And uh, well, you know, they don't tell you this, but that's how life goes after yes. school is like you learn from other people and from collaborating on projects and yes. from other people teaching you things and yeah, I'm still doing it. it's yeah it's it's funny how in a lot of school settings like that is not only not the norm but like specifically forbidden right right and it's it's kind of weird it's kind of weird and especially in technology there is so much to know. And even if all you did was focus on the fundamentals, by the time you like got your head out of your, you know, <laughs> out of your, your books, the world would have moved 20 or 30 years beyond and technology would be so different that your knowledge wouldn't apply any longer, or at least not in a traditional yep. way.